you have any questions on your exam paper, like specifically how I scored yours, or if you think that I've uh, missed something that you did right, uh, or if maybe I didn't take off enough points for a certain mistake you made, just stop by my office and I'll definitely go over it with you. Um, I, uh, I graded one of the homework assignments that was backlogged and part of the other, so I apologize for how long that was taking me to, uh, to grade your work. I wish that I had a grader for this section, but unfortunately people just keep graduating each year, so, yeah. All right, we're going to be uh, working in Chapter 8 now, and this is kind of exciting because this is where the course transitions from a lot of the background science into more of the application. And so, you know, we were learning a lot of the basics about why does it rain and how do we characterize the rain. We were learning about some of the basics of, uh, you know, why is infiltration decreasing over time. And, and it was all working towards uh, our ability to predict hydrographs. And more than just a peak flow rate, but rather predicting the, uh, the, the discharge from a watershed as a function of time. Um, so let's think in a, in a broad scale, you know, like for a catchment like this, in a large, hydro, a large hydrologic, hydrologic model, what we're trying to address is where is the water coming from, where is it going, how much of both, and so in other words, it's a mass balance question. And uh, this is a uh, model for the outflow from a large watershed that um, if you're looking at all of the main factors that account for the water in and the water out, then this will enable you to predict the discharge from a big watershed. And I did some work for the Division of Environmental Protection here in West Virginia. A couple of years ago, they had some um, chemical companies who were interested in using water. And the DEP had to determine how much water can people extract from a river um, and still leave enough for the, uh, like the, to maintain the habitat for fish and to uh, make sure that there isn't any damage. And so what we had to do is we had to look at the whole spectrum of each one of these input parameters to find out like what's the combination of worst case scenarios to see um, for a certain discharge, how often would you be taking out too much water? So for this basin, just think about the river where water is coming out of a basin. Now, some watersheds have inflows to them, which means there may be a river that's coming into a watershed. So this image is showing that the watershed in question just is bounded by a ridge line on all sides. And so this illustration wouldn't necessarily have a surface stream coming in, but sometimes we define watersheds so that there is a, a stream coming in. So of course, if we wanted to find the flow rate out, you'd have to account for the flow rate that was coming in. The rest of the mass balance is that water is going to be entering the watershed as precipitation, of course. It's going to be leaving the watershed as evapotranspiration, and so that's the combined effect of evaporation from the surface of water evaporation from soil, and then transpiration from plants, where the plants are maybe taking water from the soil and uh, breathing it out to the atmosphere, you know, discharging uh, water vapor. You'll notice here that we're saying groundwater recharge, and here in the definition it's both a plus and a minus, because depending on the uh, on the conditions, it may be that during a dry period, you have water in the subsurface that's gradually coming towards the surface and feeding the base flow of streams. And so during some parts of the year, the groundwater recharge may be contributing to the discharge out of an outlet. But then there are other times, like during periods of heavy infiltration, that actually the water is is going into the soil so that there is a, a net uh, increase in the amount of moisture underneath the surface. And so groundwater recharge can be positive or negative depending on the preceding um, storms and also depending on how slowly the water moves through the subsurface. 
So you'll, if you ever go hiking around in the woods, you'll notice that there's still a little bit of water in the stream even weeks and weeks after it's rained. And that's because water is going to be seeping out of the soil into the low points in the watershed because it takes so long for water to uh, go through the subsurface, especially when there's a lot of clay and silt in the soil like there is here in West Virginia. Now, the same thing is true about surface water storage, that it can be either be positive or negative. So if we have a lake or a pond inside of this watershed, um, it might be that the pond is filling up, and so that's going to be reducing the amount of water that's available for outflow. Or it could be that water is being released from the pond or the lake. And so that kind of a release would increase the amount of water that's in the river compared to uh, other times. Now the last two terms have to do with kind of the human uses inside the watershed. And so LQ means large quantity user consumption, and that could be a power plant. Uh, and of course, a lot of water is used uh, to cool down um, in a power plant generating steam. Uh, in chemical factories, they're using water for cooling. And so those are examples of large quantity users. Uh, there are some places where they bottle water, and that, that actually accounts for quite a bit of the uh, the water inside of a watershed, like if Dasani or if there's a, a Coca-Cola bottler in an area, then that can consume a lot of water. And then the other thing is the agricultural uses. Now, here in West Virginia, agricultural uses are a very tiny fraction of the water that's going, going in and coming out of a watershed. But in places like uh, California, that can be a huge effect, where the agricultural uses is actually the majority of the water that's going in or out. So this is the large-scale hydrologic model. And what we're going to try and do is um, predict the outflow from a watershed by accounting for each of these terms. Some of them in the short term, like over the course of hours, there's not going to be very much evapotranspiration. Like the critical events that we're trying to predict would be a storm. You know, how much water is coming out of the watershed during a storm? And so during one of those big um, events where there's a lot of precipitation, then the change in storage will be important. But the relative contribution of large quantity users and of agricultural uses, these become less important on the short term. And it's really only in the long term that some of these uh, factors play an important role. So let's talk about some of the background of these different terms. Um, abstraction is a uh, phrase that's used in hydrology to describe the initial difference between when you observe rainfall and something that's known as rainfall excess. So um, precipitation and precipitation excess, or rainfall and rainfall excess, uh, the difference there is that before water can begin to flow over the surface of maybe pavement or over grass, now, anytime the water, before it can move, it has to wet different surfaces down. You can see here is, it looks like uh, maybe some sort of tiles, and there's a, a puddle there. And before the water is going to flow sideways, there has to be a certain depth in the, uh, on the tiles. And the same thing with this roadway surface. Right, right now it's kind of glistening, and that allows you to see the texture, but it's a porous surface, and each one of those pores has to be filled before there's any movement of the water um, sideways. And so abstraction is just referring to any sort of a change in the timing or the quantity of water prior to it being able to contribute to peak flow. So abstraction has an effect of delaying the movement of water and reducing the quantity. And uh, how much abstraction you have in a watershed is going to affect the, uh, the conduits that you have to size to convey stormwater flows. And specifically, the intensity is going to be delayed by the abstraction. And we usually quantify abstraction by a depth. Like, we'll say that 
You know, if we're going to have an inch of rain onto this asphalt, maybe the asphalt uses two tenths of the inch. We're going to set that aside for abstraction. And so then the rainfall excess would be the rainfall of one inch minus the abstraction of two tenths of an inch. And so what would be left over to actually contribute to peak flows would be the eight tenths of an inch. And so it delays and it also reduces the quantity. It also is going to affect, if you've got a watershed with a lot of abstractions, that may change the sizing of pond. Uh, it's going to mean that less water has to be treated if you have stormwater treatment. Um, so it's an important factor, although usually it's only a small percentage of the rainfall. If the storm is getting towards the design, the design storm, then abstraction gets filled up pretty quickly during a five or a 10 year storm the abstraction is just going to be a small part of that. But during smaller storms, you may not even have enough rainfall to satisfy the abstraction. So sometimes if it's just sprinkling rain out, um, you know, we talk about how bad the drainage is here in Huntington and how Fifth Avenue fills up with water and it's kind of like driving through a river. But on a day where it's just sprinkling rain, there isn't any um, water going through the gutters and there's no flow to the pipes because it didn't even get the concrete all the way wet in just a sprinkling. And so you can kind of get a feel for that there's a certain threshold of water that doesn't generate any peak flow. There's no runoff until the abstraction is satisfied. Interception is related to abstraction. And what interception is, is where vegetation or buildings are preventing the rainfall from even getting to the ground in the first place. And so interception precedes abstraction. And uh, different types of plants um, can intercept different quantities of water. You can see here in this image that we have a leaf, and it's kind of just holding on to a raindrop. And so depending on how tall that plant was and how much leaf area there is, you can get a feel for you know, the ground underneath this plant may be receiving considerably less rainfall than is actually coming from above. And so you think about the, the path that a raindrop has to take to get down to the ground. And on average, how many of these leaves is it going to encounter on the way down? Now, certain trees have a lot more leaf area than others, you know, like uh, evergreen trees that just have really thin pine needles may account for less interception than oak trees, which have a broad leaf area and lots of height and uh, several different layers to the canopy. And so there have been lots of studies in the past where they've studied different uh, varieties of trees and looked at the seasonal variation of interception. Now, this percent interception is going to change depending on the storm size. And so this is just maybe a little bit oversimplifying because if you had a 100-year storm, then it's likely that you'd see a lower percentage interception than if you have a two-year storm. Um, so I don't specifically know on this table what kind of storm intensity they were looking at. Um, but it is a relative comparison, and it shows you that uh, for example, if you have, uh, where's mixed tropical forests in the summer, they'd only have 16% interception, which is kind of a surprise that it wouldn't be higher than that. But in the, uh, in the summer months, for deciduous hardwoods like we have around here in West Virginia, most of our, our trees are hardwoods like oak, for example the uh, summer months, there's a lot more interception than there is during the winter months. But there's still, just because of the, uh, the branches, uh, the wood itself plays a role in interception. The, uh, the local climate can have an effect on interception as well. Like if the, uh, if the leaf is already uh, relatively coated with like a mist, uh, because of really foggy conditions, and that can reduce the amount of interception. And uh, the density of the vegetation inside of if it's just a single tree or if it's a tree that's surrounded on all sides by other trees, then that could change the interception above or below the values that are shown on the table. And of course, 
the age and the size and the health of the vegetation. You know, a, a relatively new tree that isn't as tall is going to intercept less water than a really large, mature uh, tree that's a lot older. Um, one of the formulas, the empirical formulas that's in your book that allows you to estimate the interception is shown here on the screen. And um, what you do to apply this is you start off with a, uh, a storage quantity, S, depending on the species of the tree. And then you look at the amount of rainfall. And this is not an intensity. This is an overall amount. And so you can find out how much interception there is by accounting for the difference between the precipitation and the storage, but then also accounting for what sort of evaporation may have occurred during the storm event. And we're kind of, uh, this is like best case scenario that you're going to have an, enough time during a storm event that there will be evaporation. And so you're calculating the maximum interception that you could potentially see when you're using this formula. Um, but let's just give it a try, see what the calculations are like. If we have a uh, 1.5 hour long storm and we have 3.8 centimeters of precipitation and we are able to calculate the evaporation amount during the storm is 0.3 millimeters per hour. Now spruce trees with a leaf area index of 6.5 that is going to be going into the K value, the leaf area index. Um, that is basically meaning that if you're looking down on the tree from above, there are 6.5 layers of leaves um, from the top to the bottom. So you know, if, if you know, a tree, when you're looking at it from above, is circular, then essentially there's six times as, as much area uh, surface area on the tree as there is a uh, top view area just uh, looking at the projection of the tree. So let's find out uh, of the 3.8 centimeters how much of it is available for runoff and infiltration. In other words, the precipitation minus the interception. What's the difference between the two? What's the leftover quantity? So the time period in question is 1.5 hours. The precipitation quantity is 38 millimeters. The evaporation is 0 0.3 millimeters per hour. And then the leaf area index of 6.5. So the interception is going to be, first of all, the uh, storage times 1 minus e to the minus p divided by s plus k times e times t. OK, so the storage is 7 millimeters. And the question is, during a one-point hour storm, how much of that storage is filled up? That storage is a maximum potential. And so it could be that this. Um, this 1.5 hour storm didn't fill it all the way. So 7 millimeters is the maximum storage. In our case, it's 1 minus e to the negative 38 divided by 7. And so there's 38 millimeters of precipitation out of 7 that can be stored. Inside this parentheses, that factor is going to be pretty close to 1, as we'll see in just a bit. But the uh, plus. 6.5, the leaf area index times the evaporation rate of 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.3 millimeters per hour and 1.5 hours. OK, so evaporation during the storm event, there's going to be 2.925 millimeters of evaporation. And then 
storage mm -hmm. by the leaves is going to be 6.969 millimeters. So most of the overall possible storage has occurred. Seven millimeters is the maximum. We gradually approach that maximum depending on how much it's rained. Because there's always going to be some uh, precipitation that maybe it's a leaf that's not flat. That's what this is trying to account for is um, it's not like the tree gets fully saturated and then it's then it starts pouring at the same exact rate. Um, even when you're standing under a tree during a rainstorm, you'll definitely stay drier, but it's not like none of the uh, raindrops get through there at the beginning. They gradually uh, increase the amount that can penetrate down through the canopy. But uh, the sum of these two components, the interception is going to be 9.89 millimeters. And uh, so the precipitation amount was 38 millimeters. So the runoff and infiltration is 28.11 millimeters. So it's just going to be the difference between the precipitation that occurred and then the interception by the tree. So we'd call that the rainfall excess. So the 28.11, another word for that is rainfall excess. So I heard some whispering as I was writing on the board. Is there any questions about the example? No? Now keep in mind, this is just an empirical equation that's kind of uh, doing its best to represent what's observed. So is it always going to behave exactly this way? You know, no. But uh, it is, it's a method for trying to predict the effect that interception has. And uh, so rainfall and rainfall excess aren't always the same thing. The interception can have a pretty big effect especially if the precipitation quantity is relatively low. OK, so what are the other things that have to be satisfied before the runoff occurs? Well, one of them is depression storage has to be filled up. And uh, in any kind of a regular watershed, if we go back to the watershed, uh, there may be low points in the watershed that they're not necessarily ponds, but they could just be places where puddles are going to accumulate. And all of that puddle area has to be filled up with water before there's going to be any lateral movement of the, of the water through the watershed. And so that is what depression storage is. You can see here is a, a little bit of a roadway path, and here's just a puddle of water. And that's going to promote infiltration down into the soil, of course. and so. Um, this is just temporary storage at the surface. Over the long term, it'll either evaporate or it'll infiltrate. infiltrate. But in the short term, it's going to uh, reduce the amount of water that is being transported towards the outlet. So we kind of uh, have to account for the irregularity of the surface and estimate how much water might be stored inside of a watershed. OK, um, this image is showing uh, you know, an airplane on a runway. And runways, for obvious reasons, are pretty flat. And so it's, they, they don't want to have too much of an angle to a road, uh, for, to a runway. Uh, like in contrast to, I was noticing Fifth Avenue. I was in the left lane as I was going on Fifth Avenue. And I was kind of like, you're really leaning over sideways. It's a struggle to drive uphill and to, to go straight. So they just keep putting more and more pavement and then having to, uh, that angle increases. But the point is, is that this is really flat. And so the uh, overland flow and the sheet flow is going to be a lot slower on like a runway than it would on a road. Um, and so there's going to be relatively more depression storage on a flat surface. And so dep depression storage, the kind of trend that we could see is that the flatter the slope, the more storage there is, even just on a uh, 
on a flat surface like pavement or um, concrete. And so a steep pavement would maybe only hold on to half a millimeter of precipitation, whereas uh, if it's flat, it could be triple or even seven times as high. Um, impervious areas are going to be um, not necessarily paved, but it could be uh, locations that have more clay in the soil. And so the depression storage is going to be a little bit lower. Um, compared to lawns, the high depression storage there is related to just the surface area of the debris at the surface. Um, so forest litter means like broken off twigs and branches and leaves and maybe grass clippings and um, you know dead de decaying vegetation. And so uh, there can be quite a lot of precipitation onto a heavy forest litter before there will be any movement sideways through the watershed towards the outlet. Um, now all of this is going to be variable depending on the slope of the watershed and uh, the specific surface area, meaning the surface area relative to the plan view area. And you can think of that kind of as a porosity of the materials at the surface in the same way that when we think about the porosity of soil, it is the taking into account the, the voids relative to the overall volume. Um, the specific surface area has to do with how if you've got lots of different layers of leaves between the top and the bottom, then that each one of those outside areas has to become wetted before the water will make it to the bottom and start flowing laterally. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the previous recent rainfall events is going to have a huge effect on whether the depression storage is already wet before a rainfall event occurs. So the reason why we've been talking about these is that these are all factors that play into the response of a watershed to a rainfall event, so the stream response. That's what we're going to try and predict with uh, the watershed modeling software is the hydrograph is a function of time. And we care about that because it uh, will tell us how much water is available to be consumed if we're thinking of water as a resource rather than as a nuisance. But sometimes the water isn't a resource. Sometimes water is just something that has to be disposed of because otherwise it's going to cause damage. And you know, even when we're thinking of water that way, uh, it's really important to study and understand the stream response because it allows us to predict when floods are going to occur and it allows us to uh, plan for those by putting things like the floodgates into, uh, you know, we've got flood walls here in Huntington and they have to have some advance no notice to be able to put those gates on before the uh, river rises pretty high. Um, it also has some implications having to do with water quality and you've probably noticed if you've looked at the Ohio River that it changes colors as much as it changes height. And when it's been raining a lot, it kind of turns a brownish color. And uh, the reason for that is that, you know, coincident with really high flows through streams, is that it's able to scour more turbulent, uh, more uh, sediment. And so there's a lot more scour of like the soil particles, and then those soil particles become suspended in the water. And uh, you can almost taste it in the water that we get from the tap here. That um, Maybe it's just my mind playing tricks on me, but I seem to think that the taste of the water changes when the uh, source is brown because they're having to add more coagulants. Uh, they, here in Huntington, have um, the ability to add uh, powdered carbon to the water because when there's a lot of um, heavy rains, then it's going to uh, take the pesticides and the fertilizers that farmers use in agricultural areas. And so um, when there's a lot of peak flooding into the river, then it, uh, it decreases the water quality, and they have to kind of change their treatment that they're using. Here. How many of you have been to the treatment plant? None of you? I think probably uh, you'll get a chance. I think Dr. Yoon usually takes people over to the treatment plant here in Huntington. Um, at least he did last year. And, uh, and they'll show you where they put in the the powdered carbon to try and uh, 
absorb some of the uh, pesticides that get into the river during really stormy times. So part of the importance of understanding stream response is it allows people who are using the water or who are trying to divert the water to uh, plan their operations and understand when they're going to have to maybe change the treatment system. Okay, so a Haito graph is a graphical representation of the input to the watershed. And so it's going to be rainfall, or if we're already able to subtract out the uh, interception, and then this would be the rainfall excess. We can do a hydrograph of either one. We can have a hydrograph of rainfall or a hydrograph of rainfall excess. Now the outflow from a, uh, from a watershed, that graphical representation is a hydrograph. So hydrograph is rainfall, hydrograph is runoff. And it's a graphical representation of discharge versus time. And so here you can see that the time axis is the same for both of these. But the rainfall is always going to be a little bit before the runoff. And so the difference between the two, the difference between the rainfall and the runoff, is the travel time. And it's how long it takes to satisfy the initial abstractions, like surface storage and wetting of the leaf area, and so on. Um, there's a lot of factors that affect the, the difference in time between the two. Uh, there's a lot of factors that affect how big the peak is going to be. And so let's talk about some of the physical factors. Um, of course, the precipitation characteristics is going to play a huge role because the more rainfall you're going to get, you can expect that there's going to be more runoff. And of course, the, uh, the direction of the rainfall is also going to play a role. You know, if it starts raining at the tail end of a watershed, like far away from the outlet, and it's only on a portion of the watershed, then there's going to be more travel time than if it has rained everywhere on the watershed equally. So when we talk about precipitation characteristics, we're not just talking about the amount. We're also talking about where in the, um, in the watershed the rainfall is, and then maybe even the direction that the precipitation is moving during the storm. Uh, the watershed characteristics can include all sorts of things like the soil types, the land use inside of the watershed, and it can even be things like the, uh, the stream characteristics. Here, this is showing relatively straight streams. And if the streams are relatively straight, then it might be that the water is able to move through the watershed more quickly than if the streams are meandering. And so the sinuosity and the flow path that the water has to take between when the raindrop hits the ground and when it gets to the outlet, that's going to have an effect on the stream response as well. Um, so this representation is kind of making the point that you'll notice that the streams are getting wider as you move in the direction of water movement. And that's because at each point, the contributing area increased. So the stream is relatively narrow here because just conceptually, you know, streams don't actually look as perfectly triangular as this. But the concept here is that you have overland flow. And then there's a certain point where you've got enough overland flow that now it's channelized flow. And the channel gets progressively bigger and bigger as there's more water that's being conveyed. And so that's why this flow path is getting wider. And then you have several little streams contributing to a much larger stream. And so these lateral inflows are contributing to the increasing volume that's observed in the stream. And maybe at a certain location of interest, that's where we're either gauging the stream or we have a crossing. And that's where we have to determine the peak flow rate to size a culvert or a bridge or something like that. Um, so the book shows several different topographic patterns that contribute to how the water moves through the watershed. And the dendritic patterns is what we see in this area, where there's, relatively speaking, a uniform erosion resistance. And so it's just kind of the, the streams going from left to right are no more probable than streams that are going up and down. Um, but depending on rock fracture mechanics and where there may be are uh, plates coming together, or 
other geographic factors. There can be other types, like a rectangular flow pattern where it looks like there's a much lower probability of streams going sideways. It's just the, the flows are kind of at rock, uh, right angles. And those are characterized of uh, watersheds where there's uh, rocks uh, rather than soil that's uniformly eroding. Uh, rocks break in consistent directions rather than eroding uniformly. Uh, the, the trellis patterns may be where there is unequal resistance to erosion. And so um, if you had a ridge line, that's usually what we'd see here, is that there's no streams because there's a ridge line there. And it may be that there's a ridge line there because it's rock in one part, but soil in the rest. So if you have interspersed regions of bands of rock and then bands of soil, the soil would be eroding, but the rock would be staying uh, or maybe it's different types of soil. Like if you have a higher strength soil that's more resistant to erosion, then there can be, because of unequal erosion, just certain directions that the water seems to be moving. And then trellis patterns would sometimes be seen in a coastal plain, like on the east coast in um, the lowlands of South Carolina, for example, where there's unequal erosion resistance. Um, so um, the the flow path is going to be longest in the dendritic pattern. Uh, you know, the water traveling from one spot to another is the slowest in a dendritic pattern. But then the flip side of that is that you can have relatively steep watersheds in a dendritic pattern as well. Um, so one of the factors that you can use the computer to calculate is the watershed slope. And the computer is really good at um, looking at the elevation map that you'll, you'll feed into the computer. In the background, it's going to know the elevation of every point in the watershed. And it can compare elevations of adjacent pixels and calculate the average percent slope. And um, one of the things that's really extreme in West Virginia is we'll see wa watershed slopes that are routinely in excess of 40%, where outside of West Virginia, there I don't know of any other state that has uh, such consistently high uh, watershed slopes. And so although we have these dendritic patterns, which you think maybe that's going to slow down the movement of water, uh, what speeds things up and makes things so flashy here in the state is the fact that we have really steep watershed slopes. Um, so uh, stream ordering is just meant to show that there is an interconnected network of streams. And in fact, uh, this network may look different during wet areas than it does during dry periods. Um, but we'll get into that in just a minute. A first order stream is a stream that doesn't, uh, doesn't branch any further. And so you can see here the basin order, uh, the, the ordering is numbered. So a first order stream doesn't have any upstream branches. A second order stream receives only first order segments. And then when we finally have multiple second order streams coming together, that becomes a third order stream. Um, other ways to classify streams is whether there's always water in them. And that's what we call a perennial stream, something that always continuously is going to have flow. And it will continuously have flow because it's getting some groundwater in there. A perennial stream has a, a big contribution of the base flow being groundwater. And that's why it, it continues to have uh, water even during dry periods. A perennial stream can also be something with just a lot of upstream area. Uh, intermittent streams are the ones that only have flow during the uh, wet season. And then an ephemeral stream is one that only has flow in it like in the period just immediately uh, during or after a storm. So here's a picture of a perennial stream. This is the Provo River, which is kind of famous for trout fishing. Um, an intermittent stream where we're not going to see water except for during a rainy season. And then an ephemeral stream. This one is a ditch that's only going to receive water in the moments immediately after a rainfall event. This is the same watershed, but during uh, a dry period on the left and during a wet period on the right. And what you can see is that the reach of the stream extends during the wet period. And so the solid black line shows where there's actually water that's flowing. 
And uh, during a dry period, there's going to be these areas of seepage where the water is coming out from the groundwater, uh, kind of a wet spot on the side of the hill that feeds into the, uh, the stream. Um, but during a wet period, the flowing water extends much further into the watershed, and the location of the seepage is shifted upstream as well. So there's going to be more seepage in a greater variety of places during wet weather. And then there's also, because of just the surface, the flow at the surface, then the flowing stream extends upstream during the uh, wet weather. Um, watersheds can be nested inside of other watersheds. And uh, what this next series of uh, images is going to show is for progressively smaller watersheds, how the, uh, how the stream response changes. And so in this first one, we're looking at a, uh, a drainage area of 0.2 miles. And so that's a small watershed. 0.2 miles is pretty small. And because it's so small, the response of the runoff is very closely tied to the precipitation pulses. And so you can see that here in the Hayato graph, there was this initial burst of rain, and that's what caused this first peak. And then there was relatively nothing going on, and so it started tapering down. And then there was another pulse of rainfall. And so that rainfall pulse is what caused this peak. And then it starts tapering down again. And there's a third pulse of rainfall, and that's what causes this peak. And so in a small drainage area, there is a pretty close relationship between the rainfall intensity and the runoff flow rate. But if we, and this is, by the way, if we are just zooming in on a really small portion of a watershed inside of the state of Illinois. So this is a figure in your book that's saying, within Illinois, there's this watershed inside of the state. And so this is the overall watershed, but some tiny little portion of it that's only 0.2 miles is going to have a pretty close relationship between the rainfall and the runoff. But now if we extend that area and look at a greater, uh, a greater contributing area, so now we're looking at 3.2 square miles instead of 0.2, then these peaks kind of smear together. Um, and also, they're later. It takes more time for the rainfall to get towards the outlet. And so you'll notice that the peaks are further to the right, and the relative height is smaller than it was before. And it's not that the absolute quantity is less, because that's not the case. But um, it is. there's going to be um, just essentially a more muted response because of an effect called routing. And routing is how long it takes to move the water through the watershed. And uh, if you think about if you had a, uh, a bucket of water and you pour the water into a really long trough, when you pour the water in, if you're able to pour the entire bucket of water in just one second at the head end of a trough, then we could look at the uh, we look at a graph of quantity versus time. And it would be essentially a big pulse. So here we have a long channel. And you have a bucket of water. And you just pour it in all at once. And so it would look like all of the water is, is in there. At uh, This is maybe distance. And this is amount. So the, the, the bulk of the water is basically all together. But then think about there's some water in here. And the, the water that's on top is able to flow downhill at a faster speed than the water that's in immediate contact with the, uh, with the channel bottom. And that's because of the no-slip condition and friction. And so what that causes to happen is as we move downstream, the amount of water kind of spreads out, where instead of being all together as it was in the head end, by the time we get down to here, maybe the water is kind of like this. And then eventually, when we get to the end, it is 
spread out even more. Um, so this, this effect is called routing. And it's just the effect on amount and timing that occurs as water travels through a channel. And so what we're seeing here is that as we look at progressively larger portions of this watershed, now we have a drainage area of 16.6 square miles, we don't even see the individual peaks anymore. And because it's a wider area, the uh, time to peak has shifted further to the right. And finally, when we look at the entire watershed as a whole, 43 square miles, then it's the furthest to the right and the longest period of time until the peak. Um, so the flow mechanisms, um, overland flow is going to be wetting at the surface that makes its way to a channel. And as the water is flowing over the surface, of course, there's also some infiltration that's occurring. And so you'll notice here this figure is showing a wetting front that's get, going progressively deeper into the soil. But there is some quantity of water that, stay, that, that arrives at the surface due to rainfall and flows over the surface towards the, uh, the channel. And that's the fastest. Um, saturation overland flow is where the uh, saturation from be below, basically as you fill up the voids in the subsurface, then the, uh, the base flow into the channel is going to increase. Because there's always water that's seeping into the channel from, uh, from the subsurface. And so it's increasing the amount of groundwater movement. So this figure shows that you know, as it rains, the water table increases, and then more water makes it into the stream than otherwise would have before the storm occurred. So Hortonian overland flow is fast, but the saturation overland flow is uh, a little bit slower. And it seems kind of strange that they call it overland flow. But the point is, is that it's, uh, it's a lot faster than just uh, the base flow that takes many days after a storm event to continue draining out of the soil. It's, uh, it kind of, you push the rain in here, and some of it comes out faster downstream. It's not necessarily the same exact particle. It's just by raising the water table on one side, it exits more quickly at the other. So I guess why that, that's why they're calling it overland flow is not necessarily because it is directly flowing over the surface, but because, um, because of the speed of it being relatively quick. Now you'll also notice that some of the, uh, some of the seepage um, exits at the surface rather than exiting into the, uh, into the stream directly. So before the water table raised, it, none of it was coming out at the surface. But now it is exiting at the surface. Um, base flow is the water that's in a channel even during dry weather. So it's groundwater that's contributing to the flow in the channel. Return flow was the uh, infiltrated water that reemerges at the surface. And then during wet weather, this is another way of seeing the, uh, the saturation overland flow and the increase in the base flow because the water table is higher. OK, um, we can see the, uh, the effect of these different components on a hydrograph. And even before a storm starts, there's going to be some flow in the stream. And that's the base flow. That's the water that's inside of the channel during the dry weather. And then once the uh, rainfall event occurs and there's this rising limb, then the uh, saturation ov saturated overland flow is what's contributing to that rising limb. And the inner flow is kind of the the lateral motion of the water. So it's in the zone of aeration where it's not fully saturated yet. Um, so it's kind of as the voids begin to drain out before you get back to the base flow at any particular time. OK, well, that's it for today. Reminder that if you have questions on your exam, you can stop by and talk to me. Uh, your next homework assignment is uh, homework 7. That's due on the 23rd, so you've got uh, two weeks to do that one. Got some time to, uh, to work on that.
So I will see you on Thursday.